Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cathy. I am the festival manager and I would like to warmly welcome you to IF Oxford. So tonight's talk is called Engineering Stars and it's about the stars of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. Those people who work there who are working to find the best energy uh, to power our futures. And they come from all sorts of backgrounds. And I'd now like to introduce you to Nick Muldahl, who will introduce you in turn to members of his team um, and let you know how they, um, how they all work together at the UK AEA. Nick, over to you. Thank you very much, Cathy. It's a great introduction. And welcome to all of you that are tuning in today for this afternoon's session uh, at IF Oxford. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, by just giving a little bit of a co background context to what uh, this event is all going to really be about, really. So hopefully now we will be able to see uh, a holding screen up uh, with the title Engineering Stars. And that is what this event is all going to be about. It's, as Cathy said, it's going to be looking at the starring roles, the people that are behind our mission at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, to harness the power of stars themselves. But we are just one example of this huge wealth of knowledge that's contributing to science and engineering all over the world. There are lots of big scientific and engineering projects that are hugely ambitious and giving us lots of research and improving our understanding every day of how the universe works, how we can build new structures, how we can live better lives. And when I start thinking of big scientific and engineering projects, I'll be honest, my mind always goes straight to space. Uh, and I think that one of the biggest scientific uh, endeavors and achievements really was being able to land on the moon. Now in 1969, we put a person on a body that was outside of our planet. And although it was one person that took that first step, there was a huge support team down in mission control, guiding the Apollo uh, lunar module onto the surface of, of the moon. And then even before that, there was months and years of work to get to that final stage of that first step. Now, another sp huge space project is the International Space Station. This is a satellite orbiting around Earth, uh, giving us lots of uh, data about uh, what's going on in Earth and around the atmosphere, but also there are experiments happening on the space station as well, including ones uh, looking at biology, for example, and how life uh, is functioning uh, on low or uh, in Earth's orbit. And they were also uh, studying human condition when uh, in space and on different space stations. And as the name uh, suggests, it's the International Space Station. It's again, hugely collaborative with countries from all over the world contributing uh, to this project. Now, some of you might recognize this last image here as well. This is a sort of final space related image. And actually, uh, it's an image of a black hole. Um, last year in April, uh, we managed to get the first ever true image uh, of a black hole taken uh, by the, mainly by the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, but with lots and lots of computing power uh, actually needed to generate this image from lots of different um, angles that the telescope took. And so these are just kind of like three examples of how uh, huge teams are needed to generate scientific research. And that's just in space. If we come back to Earth, well, this might be one uh, that some of you recognize, some of you might not. This is uh, the Atlas detector at CERN which is part of the Large Hadron Collider, a huge particle physics experiment, trying to expand our understanding of the nature of the universe itself. 
and how fundamental particles of the universe work. Now, that is an image of the Atlas detector, and you can probably just make out a person standing uh, at the front. It's a huge machine just at the detector level, but the Large Hadron Collider itself is really huge. So huge that it's actually a 27 kilometer ring underground and crosses two countries. It actually crosses the Swiss French border. And this is an engineering feat as well as a body of scientific research. Just building this gigantic machine underground took in itself a lot of effort, a lot of engineering skills to come up with the designs, perfect the designs, and then be able to have a design that will generate all of the scientific research because it's all well and good to build a fantastically engineered device. But if it doesn't quite work in just the way that's needed to get the scientific output, then in itself, it's not performing its true function. But we're not here to talk about any of those. What we work, uh, what we research is fusion energy. And this is what powers stars. Now, stars like our sun are under extreme conditions. They have high pressures, high gravity, and extremely high temperatures. And those extreme conditions found in the center of all stars actually creates the ultimate power source. Atoms in the center of all stars are under extreme conditions, can fuse together. And when they're pushed together like this, they can actually generate fusion energy and create an energy source that then gets transferred into heat and light that travels out from the sun to here on Earth, sustaining all life. So really, all of the energies that we have here on Earth and that we use is coming ultimately from the sun and from fusion. Now, what would it be like if we were able to harness that ultimate energy source in itself? Well, that's what we're really trying to do at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, is generate fusion energy in a safe and sustainable way so that we can use it as a future energy source to power all of our homes one day. And actually this is all happening in Oxfordshire in a place called Cullen Science Centre. So we're largely based down here, uh, just outside Oxford and above uh, sort of Didcot and Abingdon if you live nearby. And there's, quite a few different places on our site. Um, beyond us, uh, there's actually other scientific and engineering establishments. Um, but our work splits largely into uh, work being done on two fusion devices. One is called JET, the Joint European Taurus, and that's the one we're going to focus on a lot today. But we also have uh, another fusion device called MAST Upgrade, which is really pushing the boundaries of designing these different fusion machines and trying to trial a different design that might be even more efficient than the ones, ones that we've been working on for several years to get towards a commercial fusion power station one day. So what is JET? For those of you that don't know, it stands for the Joint European Taurus. And it's a huge machine. It's about 12 meters tall and sits in a huge warehouse. And it's an engineering marvel. I think it's pretty incredible. I know I'm biased, I work there um, and I work in the communications team. So my job is all about telling people about the wonders of our work. But I do truly think that JET is a very special machine. It's been around for about 30 years and has been generating lots of particle physics or plasma physics data, helping us understand how to create the conditions to make fusion energy, this ultimate energy source. And we've been improving our understanding of fusion from these, this machine over the years. 
And a lot of that has been has benefited from engineering. You can see in the latest picture that's just come up that it is quite a messy mis machine in itself. And that's because over the years, we've added lots of new features to it. To get those fusion conditions, we need huge and powerful magnets. We need heating systems to get us up to extreme temperatures. And we also need lots of detectors that help us understand what's actually going on inside the machine. And this is what it looks like inside the machine itself. This is inside the vacuum vessel object and where when we pump in our fusion fuels of deuterium and tritium forms of hydrogen gas that we can turn on our machine and create fusion conditions that will fuse these deuterium and tritium atoms together to generate energy. Now I mentioned that our ultimate goal is trying to create a commercial power station from fusion. And actually, this is what the latest project of the UK Atomic Energy Authority is working towards. And it's called STEP, or Systerical Tokmak Energy Production. Our STEP reactor will be the UK's first prototype fusion reactor design planned for 2040. And we hope that with this prototype, we'll be able to show the UK that we can have this new form of energy that will be low carbon, sustainable, and practically limitless in terms of its fuel. And we'll be able to help combat climate change, help combat the energy crisis, and really keep giving us all the power and energy demands uh, or meeting those power and energy demands that we'll have to keep having our high quality modern lives we all enjoy. But to get there, we need people. And that's really what we wanted to make this event about. With all of these different scientific projects and especially fusion, there's lots of different people and roles that are needed to bring these ideas into reality. There are operational teams so I think of mission control for NASA. In Fusion, we have a control room that manages jets and starts off all of the plasma physics experiments. We also have material scientists. We have a whole team dedicated to developing our personal skills and training up new graduates and apprentices. We have a communications team that I work in that tries to get all of our information out to the public and to the media so that people know about what we're doing and that we can bring this technology, uh, bring everyone along with this new technology. There's obviously lots of engineering work that goes on at where we are. And we're also looking at new business and spin-off innovation opportunities that will come from this sort of scientific research. And then there's lots of other groups as well, such as our computer scientist teams. I've already mentioned our apprentices and graduates that we're continually training up. And then last but not least, in any means, there's also a leadership team and executive committee that helps steer all of the strategy for us and keep us all on track and towards our mission of creating fusion energy. So bringing all of this together in the context of fusion, We've got to work towards a fusion power station and the design of fusion power in the future. And to get there, we need all of these different areas to be working together collaboratively and side by side to enhance our scientific understanding, improve our engineering designs, and ultimately get us towards our mission of generating fusion power. Now, what we decided we were going to do for the rest of this session is actually effectively have a discussion between some of the different people that are working at the UK Atomic Energy Authority and UK AEA and see how all of our different roles kind of fit alongside each other and how we are all in our parts contributing uh, towards this scientific goal. But also looking at how we all decided to get into this field, because we'd really like to hope uh, that some of you that are watching 
are watching because you're really interested in our work and potentially even working in scientific and engineering fields yourself someday in the future. And so we also hope to show you that there's a place for everyone in any big scientific project that's going out there. So these are the people that we're going to uh, meet today and that we're going to have a discussion between. I am Nicolas Mordal, I'm the Education and Public Outreach Manager working in the communications team. We have Jess Korzanowska, who's a systems engineer. We've got Chitra Srinivasan, who's a real-time control software engineer in our computing department. And we've got Ant Shaw, who's a plasma physicist working in spectroscopy. He'll explain more about what that is. And then we also have Claire Davis, who's our People Development Manager. And just before I hand over to each of these to introduce themselves more fully and start off our discussion, please do put any questions that you've got in the Q&A section. We're going to have a bit of a discussion for about 15 or 20 minutes or so, but we'd love to hear your questions uh, for everyone as well. So do feel free to pop any questions that you've got at any time just into the, into the Q&A box when you're ready. Okay. So um, I've been working at UKAA for uh, just about three years now. Um, and my role really looks at uh, getting information out to the public. Um, so I organize science festival events like these. And I also uh, am in charge of our schools and university outreach, trying to get lots of students to come onto our site and experience what it's like working where we are at the UKAA in color. Jess, do you want to introduce yourself next? Yes. Hello, my name is Jess Korzynowska and uh, Nick already said I'm a systems engineer. Um, I've been working at UKA for about two and a half years, coming up three now. Um, and I, um, systems engineer means that instead of working on a particular piece of a hardware component, you look at the whole picture, the, the big picture of your fusion power plant um we'll go into more on that later <laughs> if i think nick you thanks very much jess uh next we will hear from chitra hi i'm chitra and um, um i'm a real-time control software engineer i have been in uk from the last 10 months i enjoy working here and um, what is great about real-time control is that um, in my work, success is determined not just by the accuracy of the result, but also by the timeliness of the result. In case the result is accurate, but not timely, then it is said to have had a failure. So it's quite a challenging task and I really enjoy working here. Uh, before this, I did similar work. Uh, I did real-time control for uh, medical ventilators and smart energy meters. So this quite uh, relates to my earlier experience. Um, that's another thing that's good about my job. Brilliant. Thank you. Great to hear from you. Uh, and then next we'll hear from Ant. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so yeah, I'm Ant. Uh, I'm a, it says plasma spectroscopist. That's sort of the technical term for my role. Um, it basically means I work um, doing diagnoses of the plasma. Uh, Nick mentioned that we have lots of things inside JET to measure all of the different things that are going on in there. Um, and that's basically my role. So effectively, it's working as an experimental physicist. Um, I've been working at Cullum for about seven years or so, actually straight out of university after doing a physics degree. Um, and I've been doing various sort of physics-y roles for the first few years and then spent some time doing, uh, dabbling a little bit in computer science uh, before returning to the sort of physics side of things and operations. Cool, really interesting. And then last but not least, we have Claire. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I, I feel like the odd one out in this group because I'm the, the non-scientist, non-engineer person. Um, and my title gives it away. I'm the People Development Manager at UK AEA and have been there for around about 10 months or so now. And my role kind of 
it is what it says it is. Everything about my role is how we develop people, both new people coming into the organisation, how we support young people in their careers with our graduates and apprentices, um, and also how we enable people within the organisation to continue to grow and develop with their skills and their experience and their knowledge. And I won't go any further than that, because I know we'll get more into it a little bit later. Fantastic. And thank you all very much for uh, coming and wanting to be part of this event. Um, hopefully, uh, those of you viewing this have kind of like already got a glimpse of just how varied all of us are. Uh, and you'll learn more about how we kind of like come into our roles uh, as we go through the discussion. Um, but to kind of kick us off, I really wanted to uh, kind of ask where each of you see your role kind of fitting into the big picture of the organisation. Um, uh, how about we go with Ant first? Um, yeah, so mine is possibly one of the ones that's maybe easy to sort of see uh, how, it, how it fits in, in terms of uh, it's a role that really is related to actually understanding the nature of this kind of reaction that we've got going. Um, in order to develop something like this into a power source, you need to be very confident that you understand everything that's going on inside your reactor. It's, you couldn't run something like this without that. And so with the kind of measurements that we make in the ex sort of experimental groups, we can learn more about what's going on in, in the plasma. We can develop models for how everything behaves. And by doing that, we can actually design future machines better um, and in ways that will allow us to optimize how we use this fuel to actually build a machine in the future. Um, all of the sort of next steps of machines uh, still include an awful lot of uh, diagnostics that will allow us to measure these plasmas. And even when you get up to the point of actually having a reactor, you will still need to understand what's going on in there, although you will presumably try to measure it and probe it a little bit less because it will be running in a more steady state way than we currently do. It's, it's very experimental at the moment, so there's always lots going on and lots to change. So yeah, you're absolutely key to the core research. Would, would you say that you're, you consider yourself sort of an experimental scientist? Most certainly, yeah. The, the, the theory side is um, a little advanced for me, if I'm honest. Um, we do have, obviously, on site a, a strong sort of theory and modelling group as well, who will uh, develop a, a, a more thorough model and understanding of, of what goes on. Um, but it is inherently something that's going to be quite a mixture between empirical understanding and theory, because there's so much going on when you've got um, you know, billions and billions of particles at incredibly high energies. There's so much going on that you can't just um, you can't just model everything. So you have to take some experimental understanding of it and then build on that uh, in order to get stuff out. So yeah, you, you definitely need both sides, but certainly in the experimental camp. Nice. Um, and I think that kind of like leads a little bit on to Chitra, actually, uh, who's also doing core research. Yes. Um, so here, the big picture is nuclear fusion. Um, like in any physics process, there are many parameters involved in this, like temperature, density, shape of plasma, and so on. Um, when there are parameters, uh, there is measurement that needs to be done. And when there are measurements, there is control, which is important. Uh, we need to make sure that the measured values do not go above the upper limit or below the lower specified limit. They should stay within the specific range. And uh, so that is, that is what is meant by control. And this control is not something that is done one time at the start of the process. This control is dynamic or real time, which means that it's done during the entire span of time when the process is going on. Um, so that is exactly what is real time control. And uh, that is where my contributions fit in. 
And uh, so uh, this is how it is. Um, me and my team become an intrinsic part uh, of this group and um, we contribute to the overall process of achieving this uh, big ambitious plan. They are just really all about how the machine is working and getting all the parameters just right. Well, really interesting. How about you, Jess? Because you kind of sit across quite a few different areas, really. Yes. Um, when I am explaining about what systems engineering is, I like to use the analogy of a puzzle because we're big jigsaw puzzle fans in my family. Um, and if you think something like a fusion power plant as a, a hardcore 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, um, and the designers and uh, people sort of working on very specific bits, like we've already just heard about, are working on individual pieces. Um, but you need somebody to sort of organize what those pieces have to look like, where they're gonna be placed, how they fit in with other pieces, um, those engineers are kind of the person that sat there with the box lid looking at this, uh, what the whole puzzle is going to look like when it's done and going, okay, you put your piece over there and have you talked to the person next to your piece and, and making yeah that, that big picture view. Um, and what that looks like really in my day to day job is talking to lots of people like stakeholders, the person paying for it, the person using it, the person who might get some data from it, um, talking about what they need. Um, talking to designers as well. There's like a big people aspect in my part of engineering um, and writing huge lists of requirements of what something is required to do. Doing these huge diagrams called system architectures, which are um, basically just giant pictures, but with lots of boxes and arrows showing how all different uh, bits of your uh, power plant fit together, who's doing what bit, what functions they fulfill, and then checking at the end that you've actually, what you've built actually is what you intended um, to build and does it meet your requirements? So in Fusion, because it's so complex, you have to have this kind of organization and you have to have some kind of way to manage the complexity and systems engineering is how you do that. And it originally came out of um, the space industry. They used it at NASA who wrote the systems engineering guidebook to end all guidebooks. Um, and so if we're going to do kind of like you were saying at the beginning, Nick, with these huge engineering challenges, Fusion is one of those. So we need to use everything we know about, you know, organizing it well, managing it, um, keeping tabs on things because these projects are years long. And if you've, I can't remember a requirement that I have written two months ago, let alone somebody else coming to it two years down the line and going, why on earth have you written this? So it's really important um, and sits across all the different uh, um, like individual areas to bring it all together and integrate it and that's that systems engineering <laughs> I, I absolutely loved getting to know you and learning about systems engineering it's given me <laughs> such an appreciation for just how cool it is to everything <laughs> yeah it is so I will yeah we're doing a bit at the minute at UKA uh, called a year of systems engineering and this is about getting everybody on board with this and, and understanding how to use these processes so that we can all move forward towards fusion together in the in the best possible way that we can nice um and i think kind of my when my role kind of sits in um is as one of the support teams there's lots of different support teams uh, out there that works across the organization um making sure that we can bring all of this technology out to everyone um, so really I'm part of the sort of uh, framework that's trying to inspire the next and the current generations with what our uh, work is um, and actually kind of like I feel my role I uh, sort of links in fairly nicely I think with Claire's quite a bit um, so Claire kind of like do you expand on where you sort of see yourself fitting into the bigger picture so my role um is is the kind of bit like you nick it covers the whole of the organization so i need to know enough about what each part of the organization does to be able to understand the kinds of people the experience the skills the knowledge the behaviors the competences they need in order to make their part of the organization come to life and do what it needs to do um, and it gets encapsulated in the term people development. And that can be anything from arranging a communications training course to finding the right PhD through to our apprentices and our graduate program. 
So it kind of filters out into all parts of the organization. And just some days it feels like I have my fingers in way too many pies, but it's absolutely fascinating. Oh yeah, no, I know what you mean about fingers in too many pies. <laughs> like it's, it's really funny. Uh, as another person in sport teams, we cross over so much with so many different people. We actually get to know a lot of different people across site, which is certainly one of the things that I like most about my job. Um, and I suppose that was going to be what I like, asked next. Why? What do you like most about your job? And also, what attracted you to joining uh, UK and joining the Fusion Mission, if you like? Um, how about Chitra? What brought you here? Oh, you're muted, Chitra. Do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what attracts me? Uh, um, actually, um, I have heard that um, happiness is not just at the end of the road, but it's all along the way. I feel that's quite true here. Uh, so whenever a given project is complete, um, I feel happy uh, just because it's complete. The completion uh, and the results the, all give me happiness. And uh, during the process, I get stuck up in many places. There are challenges. Uh, when I finally uh, work out how to overcome those challenges and when I uh, come out of those stuck situations, um, again, I feel happy in, in several different times throughout the process. So um, that's what I, I like the challenges in this job, uh, to put it simply. And uh, what attracted me to UKA is um, um, the culture here and um, the um, a research attitude of the people here. Um, it's a research organization rather than a business organization. And uh, they happen to be doing, in my role, in my team, they happen to be doing exactly the same type of work that I did before, but on other uh, scientific products. So that's another reason what attracted me to this job. Um, overall, it's really nice to work here. That's really cool. Um, Claire, I know that uh, me and you certainly had no fusion background uh, whatsoever. Um, so what, what brought you as someone that doesn't have any kind of like fusion background to work in the role you've got? I know it does seem a little bit odd and it's been, <laughs> a, from that side of things, a really, really steep learning curve. But um, it's a heck of a challenge to be uh, responsible for a people development function that the span is so vast of the kind of things that we're trying to enable people to develop their knowledge and their skills and their experience and their capability in to understand um, and it's unusual to be so forward thinking in where we're trying to get to so when I'm thinking about um, even something that feels as straightforward as our learning and development offer I'm not necessarily just always thinking about right now what does UK AEA need I'm trying to understand where it's trying to get to, what each department is trying to achieve. So we're forward planning three, five, 10 years in advance around what that might look like to think about what we need to be offering now. So we're future proofing for the skills we need in it going forward. Um, and that's a fascinating challenge. And it's, it, that is a core part of UKA's people development function um, and probably more so in this organization than you would normally see in this kind of role. And that's such a great challenge to get your teeth stuck into. That's so cool, actually, because I mean, that's the sort of thing where you're saying you're constantly looking into the future to be like, where are we going and what skills we've got? And that's exactly what everyone's doing, whatever role they're in, because even mm. if you think of the engineering lot, they're, they're trying to constantly refine and perfect their designs to bring us towards that future power station. And your role is there to give us all the skills to keep improving uh, everyone's abilities. And I think what, what also helps is because we're part of an organization that is, is thinking always about the future and where we're trying to yeah. get to with sustainable energy, um, from a completely selfish point of view, it then makes it really hard if people don't want to invest in, you know, really forward thinking um, people development um, tools and methodologies that marry up with that need and drive for future technology. So it's great to be able to say, 
well, you know, let's use a blended learning approach. Let's use a flipped classroom. Let's utilize technology to better equip our um, trainers. So we've got a more future-proof learning package. So that's just a little added bonus that just makes me smile. That's uh, really cool. And so you're going from kind of like future look. Um, Jess and Anne, where, where have you kind of like come from? What did you do before joining UK? Okay. Uh, how about Jess first? Uh, so um, I actually ended up in fusion completely by accident. My degree was in um, spacecraft engineering and I was absolutely set that I was going to be a spacecraft systems engineer and uh, that I did that for a bit. I left uni and went uh, to do a graduate training year at the European Space Agency um, and then I finished that and I was looking for other jobs and they just weren't really any. Um, and I um, was living in Oxford and heard about Cullum and sort of looked at the mission and went actually this looks like a really worthwhile thing to do. Um, and it's just, you know, what, you know, you just trade out spaceships for fusion. It's the same, right? So you know, I thought, oh, you know, that could be something I could do. Um, and I turned up here uh, sort of, you know, not really knowing what I think in my interview, I said, well, they asked, what do you know about fusion? I said, I think it was on a page in my GCSE textbook, but that's all I could probably tell you. Um, and I love it here now. It just because you really feel like you are, contributing to something that is so important and that's also you know funny enough that's what attracted me to the space industry in the first place was it was about you know like I was a Star Trek baby so I was like you know the final frontier like it's this you know exploration and it's the same kind of you know I'm doing something really worthwhile here this technology is going to save the world like it's you know and you come to work and working on real technical challenges that so at the minute I'm working on remote mate uh, so um robotic sort of maintenance equipment to maintain a power plant that's going to be switched on in 2050 but if we can't maintain it properly it's useless so we need to do this so this is these are the problems i'm solving right here in my spare room you know to be able to have fusion power to have a sustainable future to like continue the human race so like you know it just feels so exciting and that's what i love about it and uh, teachers said also um, that it's sort of a research environment. The people here are really passionate about what they do and, and everybody is here because they really buy into the cause. And, I absolutely yeah, love that. I, I love, love how, <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. I love how everyone I know at Cullum and at UKAA is so passionate about what they do and the mission itself. Like we, we all care about wanting to bring fusion into reality because we really believe it's going to make such a difference in the future. Um, and I, I think that actually ties in fairly well and we're kind of like where you kind of like got into this and first heard about future. Yeah so I, I've been um, in a similar way to Jess actually I've been keen in on that sort of thing and I've had a particular interest um, since quite early um, but luckily for me that was actually fusion um, when I was about sort of 16 or so and I'd, I'd actually had a tour of Cullum from some of Nick's predecessors basically in the in the outreach department um, and yeah I, I just thought it was absolutely great fun and it looked really interesting and frankly really cool and I did you know I, I, I enjoyed maths and science and things at school and I ended up doing a physics degree um, I even ended up uh, applying for sort of summer placements and things at Cullum I think all three three years of the degree that I could have done that. Um, and I didn't get any of them, uh, but I, I did apply for the, for the graduate scheme immediately afterwards and managed to get onto that. Um, I was really, really pleased uh, to be able to do something that I'd been interested in for, for quite so long. So I'm really, really glad that I'm get, I get to do that. Um, and for me, it's the sort of, so similar to Jess, it's the sort of the exploration and the problem solving and the interest in that that's the day to day. Um, but for my particular role as well in, in the experiments, it's the, the variety of what I have to do. So there are some days where, you know, when we're not in operations, when I'm literally up on a three billion pound piece of scientific equipment with a wrench, um, as you can see in the, what, the pictures that um, Nick put up in the slides, actually um doing all sort of hardware stuff and then other days it's in the office looking at data that's come through and trying to understand why the diagnostic isn't behaving itself 
um, days like today where I'm following the operations and I've been spending all day planning for one experiment that's due to happen a little bit later this afternoon. So I'm getting quite excited at this point. And yeah, it's it's that variety of the, of the day to day that I, I really, really enjoy, um, as well as the, the team. Um, it's as Jeff pointed out, the team is incredibly passionate about this kind of stuff. And it makes for a working environment where people are very keen to help one another and very friendly about everything as well. Um, and that's a that's always a really nice place to be able to work. Yeah, it really is a very supportive place, actually. Um, everyone's there trying to help each other uh, and get us all kind of like along uh, in our professional and also our personal as well. Uh, it is really nice. We've actually had a, a, a question come in um, that I think kind of like be answered by anyone. So I'll leave it up to the first person to speak. And they're asking, uh, as technology advances, how are you keeping up to date uh, with technological and uh, other developments within your field? So how are, you, how are you and yourselves and using other people in the organization uh, kind of like continuing to develop? Do you want me to step in first? A little bit. Go, go I, for it. It's definitely made um, for you. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I think um, kind of echoes what everyone's been saying is because everyone is really passionate about our purpose at UKAA, there is a great sense of personal responsibility for expanding your own knowledge and in, in whatever specialist field that may be be it with um, procurement through to um, mechanical engineering, people want to be the best that they can be um, and want to keep on top of. So it's quite refreshing from a people development point of view that we have lots of questions about, well, can I attend a course on this or can we get someone in to do something around that? Um, and I think that sort of tends to answer it. A lot of it is, is really self-driven um, and we are able to have access to lots of different resources um, and uh, publications and all those kind of things that can keep us up to date so we can keep on top of it as well and see what's coming through. But I'm sure the others have got stuff to add to that as well. Um, yeah, so I can maybe talk a little bit about on the science side. Um, so it, it sort of depends on what, what bit we're talking about. And as I mentioned, there's the variety of different things that go on. Um, but it obviously is different depending on what the technological advances is in relation to. So hardware wise, things that we use to measure uh, the machine, um, there are some physical pieces of equipment that I use every day um, effectively for measuring, measuring jet um, that are as old as the machine, you know, 40 odd years. Um, and that's because, you know, they are still the way that certain things are capable of being done. Um, but on the other hand, some of it, you know, slowly gets upgraded and improved with time resolution. I mean, the, the big one, obviously, is tech, is, is computers. And the amount of data that we can now take and sift through and analyze has, you know, exploded since, you know, since JET started. I think in the 1980s, when we were operating JET, it produced something on the order of a few kilobytes worth of raw data every time we ran an experiment. Um, and now it produces something like 50, 60 gigabytes. Um, and some of that is, you know, super fast, high definition video, which wouldn't have had stood a chance of existing previously. Um, so, yeah, so with the hardware, it can be fairly incremental, but especially with things like analysis codes and software understanding that can, that can ramp up very, very quickly. And finally, in terms of keeping track with the science, um, that's possibly one of the hardest things because we will even be updating our understanding of JET before stuff is even published um, in terms of the sort of experiments that we do. Some of the empirical knowledge that we gain, we want to use that to improve something tomorrow. We can't wait for that to be published. Um, it has to be utilized as fast as possible. So um, direct communication of the team is, is also very important there as well. Now, really interesting to see those two different sides. Uh, really. We've got the core scientific research personal or advances that people are continually having to be updated, up to date with from 
the publications and talking with peers and colleagues from around the world and the organization. And then that continually uh, trying to develop yourself with so many different uh, things that are just constantly changing, changing needs, changing requirements and all of that. Um, I am aware that we're going to be very pushed for time. We literally could be going on like this for hours. I'm sure that all of us could talk about everything. And I know there was one uh, particular question we were all really clean in to kind of like talk about um, is what uh, do you all feel uh, we should be doing to help encourage more people into STEM and a wider range of people? Uh, because I know all of us feel that the more diverse voices that we've got in science and engineering fields, the more ideas there are out there. So um, what do you think we should really be uh, doing most of? I'm going to go to Chitra first. Um, as children, um, involving in science experiments will help a lot because uh, they will then have a practical experience of what's going on. And um, it's more like a fun and play rather than like learning or studying. So um, that will help them to get attracted to science and uh, consider that as a career in future. And um, um, for to encourage the diversity and inclusion, I feel uh, good practices are already in place. So um, in with these uh, practices in the coming years, we should see um, more uh, people in engineering from both the genders, from even from um, uh, you know, the feminine gender. And um, we should also see people from other, uh, all ethnicities. Um, so um, I feel uh, there, was, there were already good measures in place uh, for diversity and inclusion compared to how it was some years back. Well, that's, that's good to hear that we feel like we, we are progressing uh, as a yes. society and getting more out there. Uh, and obviously that's one for all of the parents and kids listening in today. Hey, get on experiments. Be doing lots of home experiments uh, in your spare time when you can. Um, and uh, just kind of like finish off as well. Jess, do you have anything that you want to add? Because I know you're like, like really keen on things, increasing reach. Uh, push, I mean, if I had to say one sentence, I would say buy girls Lego. That's my <laughs> contribution. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's all I have to say. I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we can do everything we possibly can. Like I often moan to my um, superiors that, you know, I don't have any female role models in my group and please could we hire more women and you know it's actually really hard at this point because if um women didn't study engineering didn't stay in the in industry like then they're not there to employ so and there's all sorts of stats about you know by age you know really young age girls have always decided they can't do science and even me like my mum's watching and she will vouch for me I was adamant I couldn't do maths I was like no I can't do it and then when I got my grades and they were like do you think you think you can do maths now and I was like I suppose um so you know really encourage younger you know from birth you know to just to be um yeah experiments lego things that maybe aren't that are stereotypically not for girls you know i really you know it starts there to build confidence um to like that. get in that like I'm, I'm totally with you i feel like science is fundamentally uh an element of play <laughs> like play is a large part of the science we are constantly experimenting and what is playing it's like having a game of something you might win you might lose but each time you're improving and trying to win and trying to do better next time and that's what science is it's just these incremental steps of just trying to constantly be improving and a lot of us in our jobs all seem to have fun as well so why not just go and play and learn to get more involved with science and engineering stuff when you're growing up and even when you're older like get yourself a lego kit why not any legos for everyone <laughs> um so just before kathy completely cut, cuts me off because i know i'm already late i'm really sorry <laughs> um just to sort of like sum up by showing that hopefully you kind of like got an idea of just how there are lots of different people that are needed to complete any big science and engineering project and really there's a role out there for everyone and hopefully um, you learned that actually there's lots of different ways to get into 
STEM uh, and be part of these big ambitious missions as well. Um, so hopefully this might have inspired some of you to be a bit interested and maybe uh, take up the mantle uh, at some point. Um, and with that, I'll stop talking and let Cathy uh, please finish up. Thank you, Nick. I actually have one last question, and I'm not sure whether uh, Nick or Claire would be able to answer it. But if someone is interested in taking up a graduate scheme or applying for a job at UKAEA, where can they find out more information? Yeah, brilliant. I'm going to leave that completely over to Claire. Well, you're going to answer that then, Nick. <laughs> Uh, you can go to the early careers section on our website and that tells you everything about our graduate schemes, our summer placements, our apprenticeship schemes. Our recruitment window for graduate and um, apprentices will start early in 2021. But um, Cathy, I'm more than happy for people to email me directly if they've got specific questions that they'd like to find out more about. Um, and we can provide that email address if that would help. That's great. Thank you, Claire. Um, if anyone wants to um, contact us, or we've just got a, a slide come up on the screen now. So that will give you some email addresses and websites uh, to contact UK AEA. Or you can contact me at the festival um, and I can pass on any queries um, to Claire and her team. Um, but all that remains for me to do now is to thank Nick, Chitra, Claire, Jess and Ant um, for this really interesting talk today. Amazing to hear how enthusiastic you are and how passionate you are about your roles at, a at UK AEA and how the organisation is supporting you in your own career development. But for now, from me, good night. <laughs>